you know, there's often not really a direct path that someone takes to get where they're going to go. So if you'll indulge me a little bit, I'll share a little bit of that story about how I take pictures of little tiny things. Uh, I had the fortune recently of uh, discovering snowflake photography. It's been one of my passions outside of work. We all need hobbies, distractions, things that make you think about the work that you do and just how you process things. And so snowflakes have become sort of my wintertime activity. I look so forward to it by about February, about March. I'm about ready for winter to be over. So it's one of those sort of short-lived loves, and then I'm ready to, to move on. I take pictures of little things that move under a microscope, aquatic invertebrates. I photograph all kinds of things. Anything that you can see sometimes or you want to be able to see more, I photograph under a microscope. But I didn't just arrive at this point. Like all of you, we have a beginning. Um, and so when I was a junior in high school, I kind of looked like that. And I was on the high school yearbook. And a friend of mine had a camera. and. Uh, he brought me to his dark room, and it sort of changed my life. I decided that I loved photography. I didn't really know why, but it was one of those sort of curiosities. My camera for me became sort of like a necklace. I photographed everything. It just became just so much fun. But my dad wanted me to be a doctor. My mom wanted me to be a doctor. So I went to school to be study biology. So I had this sort of duplicity right from the beginning. I was interested in a lot of different things. I wasn't exactly sure what. And whatever I discovered that I wanted to do, I sort of tried to do to the best of my ability. So I photographed my biology experiments. And I photographed through the microscope. They were terrible. If any of my students now took this picture, it would be a, receive a very poor grade. And I photographed people and, and models. And I had some successes. I received a weekend edition cover on a newspaper. So I was getting validation that I could do photography in some kind of way. But the camera was ever present. Couldn't get a job after I graduated with a degree in biology and photography, so I went on and I started to uh, pursue another degree at RIT in biomedical photography. And, and there I went on to work in the healthcare field for about five years before. In 1986, I landed uh, on the faculty uh, at the school, uh, RIT. And it was there that I sort of became totally immersed in photographing under the microscope. It just it, As a biology student, I learned about cells and tissues and histology and was fascinated with the symmetry or lack of symmetry of things. And during the course of this chat, I'm going to show you lots and lots of pictures and I may talk a little bit or I may not talk at all because in the end, the work that I do is all about the picture. In this world that I work in, sometimes the picture is a science fact and other days it could be science fiction can see what they're looking for in these kinds of pictures. This is a cross-section of human cerebellum. I'm interested sometimes in making circular pictures. I'm interested sometimes in making square pictures. Other times I'm interested in making rectangular pictures. A lot depends on the application that the picture is being used for. So I can photograph for a PhD doing some research on something, or I may be photographing for myself. Each of the pictures has sort of a unique reason why it got made. It's a fetal mouse. This is a five-needle pine stem. This is a dandelion flower. Sometimes people prepare slides for me. Sometimes I make my own slides. Uh, as I say, you know, the reasons why I photograph is varied. Um, but I'm always fascinated with how things are organized, structure, contrast, uh, topography. You know, it, it's all about seeing things. Under the microscope, when things are kind of very tiny, you have to make them visible. And you do that through contrast, you do that through optical resolution, you do, the, do that through lighting. Uh, I have the great fortune of traveling and meeting people. And when I was teaching a workshop in Sweden, there was a lady there who was uh, dealing with the brain encephalopoly. And this was the... Uh, one of her samples. It's a human brain, but it just struck me as looking like coral or algae. It was just incredibly beautiful. Uh, of course, the donor uh, no longer was in the world that uh, we're in, but his, his brain lives on, or her brain. Chick embryo. Uh, this is the epiphyseal growing plates of a human bone. And I got so interested with it, I started to play with sort of symmetry and morphing and putting things together. Again, all these things are really near invisible. If anybody saw this little tiny sample, it would be about the size of a rice grain. It would have some color. It might look magenta or it might look blue, but the structures and things within. Insects can be very interesting. 
as well. Uh, this is the Lyme uh, tick, and uh, of course we know that it, it, it uh, causes Lyme disease. Dragonfly egg. I was fascinated. Why did an air bubble decide to join that dragonfly egg? I mean, where did that come from? So it's in water. The, the, the egg was in water, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this little air bubble just drifted along and joined the egg. Uh, cartilage and bone. Cartilage plates. Does it look like an astronomy photograph? This is, I just made this picture in, uh, in January. It's a camel skin, and you can see the sebaceous glands. And, one of the scientists was fascinated because there's five sebaceous gland sacs at each hair follicle, and she was finding eight and ten. And all the literature said that they're supposed to be nine, so she was just all up, so happy. <laughs> Algaes. Photograph moving things, and sometimes you're not very good at it. It's like playing a video game. <laughs> this is my first moving picture of Berseria truncatellia. They didn't really want to cooperate. Maybe that's my second picture. <laughs> You know, you gotta, they go up and down in a swimming pool and they can go left and right. So it's not so hard. Got a lot of tails and a lot of metabolic waste, but sometimes you get it. Sometimes you can make magic happen under a microscope. This is a little cocoa pod. Uh, you make things visible through other ways. There's a kind of technique called polarized light. The picture on the left is just white light. And so minerals have all kinds of birefringent properties. They're used in the forensic fields, but they're also incredibly pretty. Um, so this is just a geological mineral um, evaluated using polarized light. And so the different components of it, whatever's in there, granites and basalts and uh, biotites and epitite, all of that's in there. And when you polarize it, you're able to see the colors and the presentations of stuff that structurally would be invisible. And then sometimes I take the files and I do other things with them, almost like make wallpaper. They're just incredibly beautiful. Fluorescence is another phenomenally interesting and very vibrant tool in science, but they make for beautiful pictures. And this is the kind of microscope called the confocal, where different dyes, colorless dyes, are hit with colored lasers and they glow different kinds of ways, uh, allowing science to explore boundaries that otherwise would be near invisible. And so here we're looking at some lily anthers. And these are a couple of my alumni work out in various places around the world, and they shared a couple pictures for me. This is a worm mussels. Each of those colors sort of indicate certain kind of proteins that are present within the muscle. And then there's this whole process of snowflake photography, and I'm going to show you a lot of snowflake pictures. There is the story, none are exactly the same, no two, and that's so true. Uh, I would, you have to photograph outside to do snowflakes. You can't photograph inside. To take it inside, it becomes a water. I've seen many flakes become water drops right underneath my objective. It's terribly frustrating. Got to be an optimal temperature, maybe 22, 24 is best. So we catch them on black velvet. I run around my driveway like a nut. I know, my neighbors know it must be snowflake season. And then I pick them up with needles, little tiny sewing needles, nothing fancy, taped to a pencil. Uh, and uh, the process is always about making contrast and making things visible. So we're looking to see. That's my garage, it's not very fancy. Lots of Wegmans bags and other kinds of debris that ends up on my table. But in the end, you kind of get the, the, it's just a magical world that only I get to see. I get to take pictures of things that within a minute are gone. So imagine that. You collect it, you put it under the lens, and a minute later, it's gone. It melts into a water drop. I've done a few time-lapse things, but that's not really my interest. Um, you can see the top of this flake is still frozen. The bottom is near water. Everyone is different. There's all kinds of conditions. Not all the snow is pretty. Sometimes it can look like table salt. Sometimes it can look just like little needles. I add colors. It's not very fancy. I use recycling products, orange juice bottle tops and salsa top bottle tops. <laughs> the recycling bag from the newspaper, the blue bag, is a favorite tool of mine. Uh, that's a blue bag, believe it or not. They look like brass. They look like silver. They look like everything. You know, they're just remarkable. Look at that one. These are called platelets. These are embryonic crystals that haven't formed wings just yet. They'll form wings in time. I'm running down on my time, so I think I'm going to be perfect. I think that's my last slide, and they told me 10 minutes, and I have two, one, zero. I did get a chance to make a tiny little plug about a totally different kind of photography. I do, I 
got about 12 seconds, I'm sure. This is Cowboy Stadium in Dallas, and all of you that love photography, we do a painting with light project, and we're going to go photograph the stadium March 23rd, so follow us on Facebook. Thank you so very much.